Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20, and we're going to go through the Christmas story, and I just kind of want to just throw nuggets out at you, just little things to think about. Maybe you've never heard before about the Christmas story. I just want to read it as, uh, as the father of the house and kind of gathering his kids together and reading the, the Christmas story. You ready? Here we go. Luke 2, starting with verse 1. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for the awesome gift that we could never repay back. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's why I got you seated, because I'm not going to have you standing for 25 minutes and 20 verses. <laughs> amen. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. Now Caesar was a title used for Roman emperors, much as we use the title president today. So this Caesar was called Augustus, but his actual name was Gaius Octavius. Never knew his name was Gaius Octavius, did you? Well, some of y'all might, but, but study. He succeeded Julius Caesar, most of you have heard of him, in 27 BC and reigned until AD 14. His successor was Tiberius Caesar. You can find that out in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, for those taking notes. And Tiberius, C Tiberius Caesar was his stepson. Moving on to verse 2. Verse 2 says, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. Now, if you've studied this really in depth, there's people that kind of have a little bit of conflict in this. Some people said this is actual. Some people say, no, we can't, we can't find any of that. So there's some controversy among people. But how many of you guys know if it's the Word of God, it's true? So according to Leon Morris, he's a New Testament scholar. There's a, a fellow by the name of Justin Martyr. He was an early Christian philosopher and apologist and author. Okay? And in Justin Martyr's writing in the middle of the second century, look at your neighbor and say second century. So this is very, it's old enough to be authoritative. Okay? He said that in his own day, which was more than 100 years after the time of Jesus, he says you could look up the record of the same census that Luke mentioned. Because some people say, ah, I don't think it happened. Ah, no, there's no record of that. Oh, yeah, there is. This guy has, has written down that, that in the second century that it, in his day you could look it up. So maybe you can't look it up today, but he saw it. Verse 3. And all went to be taxed, everyone unto his own city. His own town refers not to where Joseph presently lived, which was Nazareth of Galilee, but to the town of his ancestral roots, which is Bethlehem and Judea. And it was called the city of David because King David grew up there. You can find that in 1 Samuel 16, 1. Joseph was a descendant from David. We find that out in Luke 1, 27. And the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem would have taken three days and covered roughly 90 miles. Three days, 90 miles. So this was a huge disruption to normal life. But I doubt that the Rome, I doubt Rome cared. <laughs> no, they did not shed a tear. They were after the people's money, and this was a way to get it. Verse 4. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So Joseph's lineage was traced in Matthew 1, 1 through 17. And as I said, the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem, which was just outside of Jerusalem, is about 90 miles. Some say 80, some say 90. This was not a short distance in those days. You, you didn't it just pop the car in gear and just scoot on down the road. It was a significant undertaking costing time and it cost money. And due, due to the height of Bethlehem, Bethlehem was 2,564 feet above sea level. So Bethlehem was up here. 
Travelers would go up from Nazareth. Nazareth was 1,830 feet above sea level. So to Bethlehem, uh, even though they were going south, when you went from Nazareth to Bethlehem, you were going uphill. Just like, I don't know, do we have any in here today that your parents said, well, you ain't got it tough. When I, when I, when I was your age, I had to walk to school uphill both ways in the snow. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but they had, you do, you'd had to go uphill to, to the journey. So that was even tougher on them also. Verse 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, espoused wife, espoused wife, being great with child. Joseph paid his taxes, and that's Romans 13, 8, where it tells us to pay our taxes. I don't know about y'all, but all my money, I've already declared it. When we send that stuff off, all of our stuff is going to the good stuff. All that crazy nonsense is somebody else's, not, not ours. But we do pay our taxes. It's very scriptural. Joseph paid his taxes. Joseph and Mary were not impoverished. Let me just stop there a second, let that sink in. Mary and Joseph were not impoverished. They were not poor, even at this time. I'm not even going to tell you about when Jesus was a little older, maybe two to three years old, when the Magi come. No, the Magi, the kings from the east, they did not come right now, what we're talking about. This was when he was a little older. And they brought some, listen, they brought some expensive gifts. So at that time, they were loaded. But even here, they were doing well. They were not impoverished. They had enough money that they could pay taxes. They also had enough money to travel to Bethlehem. You ain't going to travel if you're poor. And they could have stayed in a hotel if there had been a vacancy. They had the money for it. They had it all covered. And God used an ungodly ruler to draw Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy. And that's in Micah 5.2. In Micah 5.2, the prophecy of the Messiah being born in Bethlehem. God used an ungodly ruler to make sure that that come to pass. God just about don't have any other choice but for, to use ungodly rulers now in, his, in this day and time, amen? But he's still going to bring his will to pass. Prophecy will go forth. Verse number 6. And so it was that while they were there, so it was while they were there, so it was while they were there, while they were there, The days were accomplished that she should be delivered. See, some of y'all think that she just walked into town. As soon as she walked into town, her water broke. While they were there. How long were they there? They could have been there. They could have been there for a few weeks. While they were there. At the average pace of 20 miles per day, this would have taken four days. With Mary in her condition, it could have easily been a week or more. We often think that Mary, listen, we often think that Mary was close to delivery when they made this journey. But this may not have been the case at all. Well, you can't prove that and you can't unprove it. While they were there. See, Joseph may have been anxious to get her out of Nazareth to avoid the pressure of the scandal. That was hot news. She's supposed to be a virgin marrying him and she knocked up with somebody else, a kid. What's up with that, Joseph? And he wanted to put her away privately anyways. That just shows you what kind of a character he had before the angels talked to him and said, don't be crazy like that. This is of God. You're all right. This is of God. But he wanted to get her out of that town. And according to the Roman law, Mary didn't have to go with Joseph. For the tax census. But it made sense for her to go with Joseph, especially because she was in the latter stages of the controversial pregnancy. Surely the subject of much gossip in Nazareth. So he was just protecting her. He's like, girl, let's get out of here. We don't need to be dealing with all this nonsense. So it's possible that he used the emperor's order as a means of removing Mary from the possible gossip and emotional stress of her own village. Verse 7. And she brought forth, and she brought forth, 
and she brought forth. Who's the underlying subject here? She. Who is the she? Mary. Mary. Mary brought forth her firstborn son. And Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes. And Mary laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. This phrase is filled with wonder. This is one of those nuggets I'm like, I can't wait to tell. We are not told that anyone assisted Mary in the birth, though someone may have. Let's read it again. Mary brought forth her son. Mary wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Mary laid him in the manger. I'm sure Joseph wasn't getting cold feet or nothing. And of course he was there. He, he popped in. I don't know. Maybe the brother was going and getting some bread from the local inn or something. But I, 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 you can think all you want to, but, but sometimes we didn't need, need to do more reading than thinking. And when I read it, Mary brought forth, Mary wrapped him in the clothes, Mary laid him in the manger. That's very evident. Amen. That was good, wasn't it? All right. So one way or another, this young woman was completely separated from all her family and supporting friends who lived back in Nazareth. She was by herself. If y'all feeling alone in this season, she was feeling alone. She knows that feeling. And she brought forth the child. She wrapped him in the swaddling clothes, and she laid him in the manger. Now, the word translated swaddle in cl swaddled clothes or swaddling clothes. It comes from an ancient Greek word meaning to tear. So the meaning that they meaning that they were torn strips of cloth that wrapped around Jesus. He didn't even just get a hand me down. He got a rip piece of hand me downs. Wasn't even a full. She just got this one, wrapped him up. That's all, you know, that's all the material there. Let me Get this material and wrapped him. So that's what I mean, swaddling clothes. Torn strips of cloth. And he was laid in a manger, which was a feeding trough for animals. And I know sometimes y'all like to see those pictures of that feeding trough. It looks like somebody just finished it and sanded it nice and neat looking. And it was just so pretty. It was a feeding trough. Nobody got on their hands and knees and got the Brillo pads out and the Ajax and, 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 and done the, the, the feeding trough, cleaned it. Amen. Amen. That's where our master was laid. Verse 8. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Some scholars have thought that the time of Christ's birth was around the time of the Day of Atonement. And so, you know, some scholars are like, ah, it's impossible. I mean, the proof's right here in the, in, in the Scripture. Shepherds are nowhere in fields this time of year. There's no way Christ could have been born in the Christmas time. There's no way. Well, with God, there's always a way. Now, we, we're not, I'm not saying that he was born on December 25th. We don't know. It could have been three weeks from now. It could have been four weeks earlier. I don't know. But debunking that it couldn't have happened, oh, yeah, we're going to do that right now. Because Bethlehem shepherds were known to care for the temple flock. But they wasn't, them shepherds don't have sheep out in the field that time of year. Yeah, but they don't quit having sacrifices that time of year either. come out here you're going to get a lot of W-O-R-D <laughs> Bethlehem shepherds were known to care for the temple flock these could have been temple shepherds who were keeping the sheep to be used as the sin sacrifice therefore it would be appropriate for them to come inspect the perfect lamb of God and to verify that he was without blemish Woo. It could be as simple as the Lord chose the shepherds because his son would be the great shepherd of the sheep. And maybe they were the only ones who would listen to the announcement. 
But at any rate, it was prophetic for these lowly shepherds to be chosen for the great announcement because Jesus would always associate with the common and the poor. Verse 9. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Jesus came to this earth in the weakest form possible, a little baby. But he laid aside, listen, but he laid aside his glory, but not his deity. As can be seen by the angels, the angels were worshiping him right here. As a class shepherd, let me get in, in let me get up in your business just a little bit here. As a class, as as a class, shepherds had a bad reputation at this time in history. This was not the good old days when David and his daddy and all them, they had a family business going on. <clears throat> this is past those days. And these days, shepherds were not looked very high, highly upon at all. More regrettable was their habit of confusing mine with thine as they moved about the country. In other words, they would just happen to accidentally go into somebody else's field that they didn't have permission to be in. It's like, well, what's the big deal about that? Well, that person might have sheep and flock that they're banking on feeding their animals with that. But that's no different than going to somebody's barn or stable and spilling the hay for the wintertime. Y'all with me? No, okay. <clears throat> so they were accused... Uh, many shepherds were accused of robbery and using land that they had no rights to. They were considered unreliable, dishonest, and were not allowed to give testimony in the courts. That's what kind of scoundrels they were. It's like, will we have an eyewitness? Who is it? Oh, no, no, you're one of them. Mm -mm, we can't believe a word you say. So there is no reason, but listen, there's no reason for thinking that Luke's shepherds were other than devout men, though. Else why would God give them such a privilege? But they did come from a despised class. <clears throat> Just like today, we have politicians and lawyers. You don't hear many good things about politicians and lawyers, do you? Yeah, we didn't hear many good things about. But that doesn't mean that all the politicians are bad. doesn't mean all the lawyers are bad. So just like these guys, there's no reason why not to think that the Lord gave these men privilege. Because they wouldn't like the rest of them. Verse 10. <clears throat> and the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. Look at your neighbor and say good tidings. Of great joy, which shall be to who? I mean, not just the Jews. I mean, not just... All them Caucasian white folk from Europe because they got all them pictures of Jesus and he looks like he's European, which he wasn't. It's amazing how we get something stereotyped in our brain about something. He didn't look like that, y'all. He was Jewish, amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Thank you. This is a direct reference to Jesus being not only the Jewish Messiah, but also the Savior of the world. The glory of the Lord was a bright light in the midst of the darkness of night, indicating God's glorious presence. And it is only natural to be terrified at the sight of an angel, not to mention a sudden overwhelming light from the sky. People say that they hang out with angels all the time. I'm just a little leery about that. So many instances in the Bible where a real bad boy from on high reveals himself till we can see him. Most people scared. Okay? So, and, and, oh man, I could just take off and preach on this and I got to hold back my mule. See, Hollywood wants to make you think that the demons are these big 12 feet gigantic tall six inch fangs and just they'll just rip you to shreds when they're just little imps rolling around. But the same Hollywood wants you to think that these magnificent giant sized angels are these little bitty babies like with cherubs or something and, you know, Shooting arrows. Little fat, plump, baby-looking things. No, angels are mighty. Angels are mighty in power. 
So it is only natural to be terrified at the sight of an angel, not to mention a sudden overwhelming light from the sky. The good tidings concern a person, not, a, not some religion with its creeds or with its doctrines or its confessions or its outward forms. Good tidings concerns one individual and one individual only. Verse 11. For unto you born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior which is Christ. That's his messianic um, title. His Messiah. That means the anointed one. Who is the what? Savior. Christ. Lord. Jesus was Lord at his birth, although his physical body was small and totally dependent on others. Man, it's marvelous to think what he did sometimes. His physical body grew and had to learn to talk, had to learn to walk, to eat, everything else a normal child would have to do. Look at Luke 2.52. It puts that in more perspective. Luke 2.52 for those taking notes. <clears throat> but in the spirit, he was God at birth. Why? Because he was Savior, he was Christ, and he was Lord at birth. In the city of David, by this phrase, Luke was drawing attention once again to the messi messianic role of Mary's child. Jesus is Savior, Christ, and Lord. Verse 12. And this shall be a sign unto you, shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. What an irony that the king of kings would be in a stable. I'm sure this was a puzzle to the shepherds, yet no earthly accommodations would have been adequate anyways. Right. Yeah. Could have put him up in some kind of whatever, the finest thing they had today, and it still wouldn't be good enough for him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Therefore, it really didn't matter where Jesus was born. Wherever it would have been would have been infinitely less than the glory that he had with the Father. So he humbled himself. Thank you, Jesus. And they gave him a sign because it was possible that there had been some babes wrapped in swaddling clothes, but not one lying in a manger. Verse 13. And suddenly there was, a, there was with the angel a multitude. Look at your neighbor and say multitude. A multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying. So what a sight this must have been. You'd think that everyone would have heard and seen this, but it's probable that, those, that these shepherds were able to see and hear this heavenly choir, but not others. For those taking notes, you need to write, jot down John 12, 29, John 12, 29, and jot down Acts 22, 9, Acts 22, 9. There's, these are instances in the Bible where something happened, and these folks heard something, but they didn't see something. These people thought they might have heard something, but... but the others thought that they heard a voice, and everybody heard something different. So this could have been one of those cases, too, where only the shepherds were able to see and to hear this heavenly choir. The angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven. That's what heavenly host means, the heavenly army. John's vision of heaven recorded in Revelation reveals that there are an innumerable amount of angels in heaven. That's Revelation 5.11. I can't even count them all. Man, they're bad. We find out in the Old Testament, in the book of Kings, just one angel took out like hundreds of thousands of people. Just one. And now you're talking about an innumerable, an innumerable amount. Wow. Verse 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Goodwill towards men. The phrase, we sung it today, the phrase in, of the heavenly host is well known today as the Gloria in excelsis Deo from the first words of this verse 14. Glory to God in the highest. When we sing in excelsis Deo, that's what we're saying. That's where that came from. It's Latin, y'all. It's in the Latin Vulgate. It's glory to God in the highest. That's when you say glory in excelsis Deo. That's exactly what you're saying. You're speaking Latin. Look at your neighbor and say, wow, I didn't know you could do all that. And the peace that the heavenly host was singing about was not peace among mankind. You can look around right now and say, nah, Ain't hardly anybody getting along. I mean, it's not just country against country. I mean, we don't even get along with people in our own country anymore. Right. 
So it's not peace among mankind, but it's peace between God and mankind. They were rejoicing that the war between God and man was over. God is not mad anymore. He's not even in a bad mood because the perfect sacrifice has come and gone and which paid the price for any mistake that man made. God's not mad anymore. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men, not among men. But towards men. So the Old Testament God's just up there ready to just, I dare you to smoke that cigarette, buddy. It's lightning bolt and pop you in the head. I don't know where you would have got that image from, anyways. That's not our God. Notice how I said that, because a lot of people be saying God. You better be specific about which God you're talking about. But our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God, he ain't mad no more. Verse 15, And it come to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let's go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. Let us now go. This shows genuine, genuine urgency. It's not easy to even convey in the English language the sense of urgency used in the Greek language. They didn't hesitate at all. And listen, they had no quibbling and no quarreling. They were all in one accord, y'all. Rather, rather, they made an immediate decision to go to Bethlehem and see what God had reported to them. Thank God this ain't like today in the day's time. Well, I think we should go up to Bethlehem. No, let's form a committee and talk about this. And let's just see if it's something where we're supposed to do or not. Now, we haven't prayed or fasted about this. Maybe the Lord will have some of us to go. Maybe he wouldn't have some of us to go. No, we want to be spirit-led, don't we? I hope that doesn't sound familiar to you. If it does, come on out here to Redemption Mobile. Amen. We'll... <clears throat> these shepherds demonstrated faith in the revelation that they'd received. Amen. And here's a bomb. I can't move past this. When the scripture says, uh, and see this thing which has come to pass. See this thing which has come to pass. This thing is literally this word. It's the word, listen, for all y'all that study, you'll get excited about this. This word is rhema. So, so let's now go even to Bethlehem and see this rhema which has come to pass. Amen. That which is spoken, rhema is, is, is literally means a word, particularly a word as uttered by a living voice. Angelic presence does not, um, so faith comes by what? Hearing. And hearing by the? rhema of God the utterance of God faith comes by hearing not heard it comes by the utterance of God so they had the opportunity to be in faith why because the utterance come forth the rhema word come forth amen uh, also in this particular passage angelic present does not last forever angels leave that's why those that operate in a high level of faith, you don't need signs and wonders in your life all the time. Well, Lord, I'll do it if you'll have a little birdie to fly up on my window and peck it three times and chirp three times. And when I open the window, it won't fly away. And so that happens, and you're like, well, all right, awesome, I'll do it. And then your faith starts waning a little bit, you know, over a few months, and you're like, Lord, if you could just send that bird back. Lord, this time, could you make the bird? Notice how we do. We always want to up the ante, right? Lord, if the bird would just say, it's God's will. I won't doubt you no more. Well, you, you won't for a few weeks, maybe. See, you're not really dependent on faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for, but it's the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some people want to get addicted to signs and wonders and they never get in faith. I'll just pass over that real quick because 
time is slipping away. Angels leave, but people must respond. And these shepherds' theological education didn't come uh, from the synagogue or the rabbis. It came from heaven. Verse 16. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And this was just exactly what the angels told them. And it's a lovely thought that the shepherds who looked after the temple lambs were the first to see the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 17. And when they had seen it, they made known, known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. The combination of the angelic announcement and the sign of a child in the feeding trough inspired the shepherds to tell as many as they could of what they heard and experienced. When we see the Lord for who he is, we will make it known to everybody who will listen. These guys were the first evangelists. Amen. They were the first evangelists. Why was John the Baptist, the, the Jesus said he was the greatest of the prophets? I mean, you had Elijah. I mean, he was bad. You had Moses. You had Isaiah. Why did he say? Because everybody before John the Baptist, everybody, everybody said he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. But God said that John the Baptist was the greatest because John got to say he's here. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm the first in my family to, yeah, that is a big honor. First are a big honor in Scripture. Amen? Amen? Amen. Don't make light of stuff on firsts. So they were the first evangelists. They functioned with an unction, with an anointing to go tell the people of what they seen and proclaim. Listen, and even the people uh, that were... In, they were in charge of the flocks devoted to sacrifice in the temple, so they would have met those who came to worship and sacrifice. Imagine that. They were picking out a sheep to sacrifice, and they're like, oh, let me tell you about this. The Messiah is here. You ain't going to have to do that much longer. God's picked out his lamb. Verse 18. And they all, and all that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. There must have been hundreds of possible thousands who heard this message. Yet it would be 30 years before Jesus was revealed to the world. Oh, I could stop right here, but I got to keep moving. Can I just, 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 just. 30 years later. If you know that you know that you know that you know that you know God told you, hold on to it and don't let go of it. It will, it shall come to pass. Oh, I got to move on, but I want to hunker down there for a minute, but. I'm pushing myself along here. I'm sure this gave tremendous hope to those who believed that the Messiah was born. And the word wondered is, hard, is a hard word to translate with one term in, in, in this context. It says, and they heard it and wondered. It's, it's kind of a language thing. There's a language barrier there. Uh, this is a mixture of amazement and pondering uh, at work, uh, considering... Uh, a surprise. Matter of fact, other credible translations use the words astounded, astonished, marveled, and amazed. Verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary's reaction was different than either the shepherds or those who heard them. She calmly took it in and meditated over it in her heart. Seeking to understand the deep meaning of it all. The word ponder here in the Greek means to combine with, to converse, to consult, mentally to consider. So Mary was combining, listen, all the things that she had heard from Gabriel. Don't forget the big massive speech that Elizabeth got filled with the uh, uh, Holy Ghost and started prophesying to her. And then here they come these shepherds with the prophecies of Scripture. I mean, she's got a whole lot being said to her. And so she's just taking it in, 
processing in it, meditating it in her where? Because faith is not of the head. Faith is of the, the heart. This is how we get revelation from Holy Spirit. Right here. The wonder of the many was an emotion. The pondering of Mary was an abiding practice. Let me say that again. The wondering of many was emotion. But the pondering of Mary was an abiding practice. Verse 20. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. This is the last verse. The shepherds had to get back to the fields before the sheep wandered off. So they returned, but they were glorifying and praising God. They knew they had a special message and they had been privileged to be a part of it. And what an opportunity to have a revelation that, listen, kings and priests and the majority of the people on earth didn't have. What a privilege. Because you'd think, well, the best of the best of the best would... That's your thinking. That's the world's thinking. That's not God's thinking. Amen. Besides, who is the best of the best? Man, there's going to be some people that's going to be racked up in heaven with stuff that you had no idea about. And some of the super evangelists, you think they're going to have a mountain of stuff? They might have a little pile of something. The little old lady over here, man, she got the mountain of stuff. <clears throat> These shepherds valued what they seen and heard. The closing remark, just as they had been told, notes a major theme of Luke. As the book of Luke, he sought to reassure Theophilus. If you'll read the very first of Luke and of Acts, he's writing to a person, Theophilus. He's assuring them this, this happened. Listen, he's assuring them that God does what God says he will do. Trying to reassure you, Theophilus, God's going to do what he says he's going to do. Glorifying God is one of the keys of staying full of God and to keep alive the memory of all that he has done and shown us. Play the music and stand to your feet. Repeat that last line. Glorifying God is one of the keys to staying full of God and keeping alive the memory of all that He has done and shown us. Why is that important? Because you can't be thankful for what you don't remember. Well, what are you thankful for in this time and season? If you're even breathing right now, you have something to be thankful for. I know that's so cliche. For all you young people, just wait till you get a little older. You'll start appreciating that more. You, listen, you think that you're owed that next breath. You don't even think about it until you get about, you know, 42 or something like that and you start hitting the, <clears throat> hitting the jog a little, just as hard as you did when you were 26 and all of a sudden you have to pull over and you have oxygen jet and your heart's just racing and you get a little lightheaded and you ain't never felt like that before. Amen. What are you thankful for? What may you need to remember to be thankful? There's things to be thankful for. You just don't remember. We are so, have such an entitlement mentality too. It's like, what have you done for me lately, God attitude? We don't remember that, okay, you got me out of this. You delivered me from that. I didn't have to deal with that. I got that half off. And this over here, it never even materialized. But yet today we can stand in the presence. Of God, Lord, help me with this. Lord, I don't know about that. Oh, God. Like he hasn't done anything. It's time to be thankful. Ask Holy Spirit to bring to remembrance all the prophecies, all the victories, and all the blessings that God has bestowed on us and have a feast of thanksgiving unto the Lord. There's something to be thankful for. There's always something to be thankful for. 
Hallelujah.